of the book of the Revelation and the end of the scriptures, we're, going, we're receiving here encouragement and a word from the Lord. Uh, brother, what something Brother Jason said this morning made me think of this, uh, the allusions that the Apostle Paul made to fighting and running. In a, a fight, <clears throat> you know, you've got to prepare for a fight and this, it's like, this is like sound doctrine, where you're taught <clears throat> what equipment you have and how to use it, and your strengths, and the enemy's weaknesses, and, and proper technique, and it's, there's instruction involved. But then when you actually get in the fight, and you're in the middle of it, that's not the time for instruction. That's, right. that's the time where, where you need people rooting you on. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need someone speaking to your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Lord's doing here. Yeah. So this is the end of the vision of the holy city, which is also the end of the book of the Revelation <clears throat> of Jesus Christ. And so all of our final considerations in this book are, are of course, going to be on Jesus himself. <clears throat> what is the holy city but his own bride? He redeemed us. He bought us and made atonement for us. <clears throat> He reconciled all things to God our Father. He is our great shepherd and high priest. He intercedes for us. It is he who is bringing us to this place. He enabled us to overcome the world. It's his inheritance that we're being brought into. This holy city which we have been considering, also the new Jerusalem, is being built by him. It's shining brightness, which is the precise reflection of God's glory, emanates from the whole host of the saved of the earth, every single one of which Jesus purchased with his blood. Mm -hmm. And he formed and fitted to become part of this temple of God. Yeah. It descended out of heaven because Jesus made a new heaven and a new earth for the city to dwell in. Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion, is the city of the great king. It's precious because he made it precious. The entire scope of creation, salvation, glorification, and eternal rest, both for God and for the saints, is all the work of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He has done all of this. It is done because He has done it. He makes all things new. He laid Zion's foundations and set her walls and installed the gates. He designed and built the holy city incorporating his own holiness and perfection into it. Amen. Its street magnifies his work. Its perfect dimensions and blessed people are his fruit. His light lightens the city. He gave all the redeemed access to the fountain of the water of life and the river of water of life and the tree of life. He removed the curse and installed the throne of God among men. He is God's glory and he is our glory. He is God's rest and he is our rest. He's the peace of God and he is our peace. He is blessed of God and he blesses us. He is God's priest and our priest. He's God's king and our king. He's God's man and our man. So if you come away from the book of the Revelation, <clears throat> worrying about how bad things are going to get on the earth and who the Antichrist is and what he's going to do and how terrible things are and whether or not you're going to be able to buy food or not, <clears throat> then you need to go back and read it again because you missed the whole point. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This isn't a biography, it's a revelation. This is the testimony of heaven given to the saints living in the last time. And there is no higher testimony. There is no more powerful testimony. Here in the end of time, the Lamb himself, as he sits on the throne of all heaven and earth, as king over all and lord over all, testifies to believers. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Here at the end of the Holy Scriptures and at the end of John's vision, we are receiving the stamp of the royal signet of the Lord's Christ. So are these things true? Will the world be overcome and destroyed just as it is written here? Can the new Jerusalem be so gracious and glorious as we have seen? Was John faithful in what he wrote here? Or 
or did the scribes make some mistakes? Can we believe this Bible that has been handed down to us, or has it been corrupted by the skewed interpretations and pens of men? Here at the end of Scripture, we have the confirmation from the highest, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you in the churches. Therefore, let no saint doubt what God has promised here. <clears throat> Truly, this is the eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. How could God promise this before he even made the earth or mankind? How could this be? It's because the word, his Christ and the Lamb. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Mm -hmm. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Well, now when Jesus walked on this earth, he did testify of himself, and his testimony was true, and God confirmed it to be so, with signs and wonders and with his own voice from heaven. How much more, now that Jesus is in heaven, should we receive his testimony? God hath in these days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. <clears throat> all the prophets testified of Christ. John the Baptist testified of him. The apostles testified of him. This book is the revelation of him in heaven. And now in the end of the book, in the end of the world, <clears throat> the Lamb on the throne sends his angel to bring Christ's own testimony of these things. Now from heaven... He testifies to all. <clears throat> Psalm 138, verse 4 says, All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. <clears throat> Who does this angel serve? He's the servant of Jesus. Who sent him? Jesus sent him. Who was the angel sent to? Jesus sent him to his churches to bear his testimony. Peter wrote, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. The testimony of Jesus is as sure as any man can possibly have. And here we have it in the place where we see the vision of our eternal home, the temple of God, the place where God will be with us and we shall see his face, the place where there is light and glory and healing and eternal life, where there is no more curse, no sorrow, no crying, nor pain, where we shall reign with Christ forever and ever. This is the fitting place where Jesus testifies. Yes, amen. When you are troubled, hear Jesus testify. When you're burdened and sorrowful or cast down or weary or battle-worn, come and read this glorious context in which Jesus is testifying to the churches, in which the King of kings and Lord of lords has stamped his own testimony. Whether you're discouraged or cast down, or maybe you're, you're already on the mountaintop and rejoicing <clears throat> and thirsty for more of God's grace and glory, well, then you can hear this testimony of Christ unto you in the churches. His testimony is unto you. The exalted Christ is not speaking into the air. He's not testifying to the masses or to uninterested people. Jesus is testifying to you in the churches, you who are fighting the good fight, you who he has chosen, you for whom he intercedes, you whom are accepted of the Father, to you who have ears to hear, Jesus sent his angel to testify unto you. Yeah. Amen. Because the saints are living by faith in this world, we need a word from the throne. <clears throat> Amen. Our faith requires the promises and testimony of God to keep our hope alive and flourishing. It was hope in God that carried Jesus through in the cross and through the grave, and his hope was not in vain. Jesus was not disappointed in the outcome of his sacrifice. Yes. Jesus lived and died for God, and now he testifies to us that if we do the same, we will not be disappointed either. It is hope in God that will bring us through this wicked world. From the 119th Psalm, Remember thy word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort and my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. And Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait 
In his word do I hope. If you need hope, then you need the word of God. And here we have the very testimony of Jesus Christ unto you in the churches. If you believe what Jesus says to you, you will overcome the world. Amen. If you receive the testimony of Jesus, you'll have no reason to fear death. You'll have no cause to dread the judgment. If you believe the testimony that Jesus gives here in the Revelation, you will keep yourselves pure and unspotted from the world. You'll be found in Christ when he appears. You'll be like those five wise virgins who were ready and had their lamps burning bright and went in to the supper of the Lamb. Amen. When the marriage of the Lamb has come, his wife will be ready, and we will be ready because the Lamb testified to us from heaven. <clears throat> Jesus' testimony is to the churches, and it is in the churches. Where else could you expect to hear the testimony of Jesus Christ? But in the churches, we understand very well <clears throat> that the general term the church is, does, does not necessarily have a good sound to us at this time because of the prominence of Babylon. Yet in the churches is the place where Jesus testifies. Amen. He does not broadcast his testimony to the saints from the government uh -huh. <clears throat> or from the politicians or from the philosophers or from the scientists. Yeah. Jesus is not testifying through the world Regardless of the corruption that is settled in the nominal churches, his testimony is still in the churches and to the churches. Perhaps some churches barely have his testimony. Perhaps some are in danger of having their candle put out. We cannot deny that there are many that need to repent. There are many that claim to be churches but are really the synagogues of Satan. We know that some that are churches now are not going to endure to the end. Jesus does not condone nor receive everything that is in the churches, nor does he receive all the churches themselves. The book of the Revelation ends with the same kind of word as it opened with, and that is Christ's message to the churches. <clears throat> His testimony has been delivered by the angel to the churches, and until heaven and earth passes away, that is where his testimony will remain. Jesus has sent his testimony to the churches. Some of the different translations say testify these things for the churches or before the churches or among the churches. <clears throat> Jesus testifies to the churches because that is his bride. Yeah. Jesus' testimony to his bride is to tell her about her glorious, triumphant bridegroom, yeah. her inheritance and rest, the glory that awaits, and to exhort her to be ready when he comes for her. All power and authority in heaven and earth has been given to our bridegroom, get ready to be married to him. And Jesus doesn't mince any words when he speaks to the churches. If a church doesn't love him anymore, he's going to tell them about it. If a church needs to repent, he firmly tells it to repent. If he has something against the church, he tells them and warns them, I have a few things against thee. Jesus will say to some churches, I have not found thy works perfect before God. He will say things like, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Yeah. Of course, Jesus doesn't just testify bad news. Yeah. He says the truth. Whoever doesn't listen to Jesus won't be getting into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death and hell. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and that shutteth and no man openeth. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Amen. And Jesus testified to John right. For these words are true and faithful, and these sayings are faithful and true. And behold, I come quickly. 
and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, and I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus himself is the subject of his testimony. He is the one who saved us. He is the great shepherd of the sheep who is leading us on our pilgrimage through this world. He is our glorious bridegroom and our everlasting reward. If the saints can see Jesus and hear Jesus testify, they're going to make themselves ready for the day of his appearing and to be married to him. When the call goes out, the bridegroom cometh. It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, and we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord, and we have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Jesus sent his angel to testify these things. <clears throat> these things are the revelation delivered to us. <clears throat> Jesus himself is testifying these words. People can leave a testimony that does not necessarily consist of words that they said, <clears throat> but Jesus' testimony in the churches is not just like a reputation that he had <clears throat> or just a report of his general conduct while he was on earth, <clears throat> although that's part of the record, but Jesus is testifying the word of truth. He's testifying of himself, who he is, what he is doing from heaven, his power, his wisdom, his honor and glory given him by the Father, of his ability to reconcile all things to God and to bring the saints home safely and without spot and to judge the world in righteousness. <clears throat> what manner of man is this that testifies to us from heaven? He says, I am the root and offspring of David. <clears throat> God raised up David to be the king of Israel. We think of David, that's the foremost thing that we ought to be thinking of, is that he's the king, mm -hmm. the king of all Israel. And his reign, of his slaying the giant Goliath, his fearlessness and might in battle, and his tender heart, his desire to please God and his meditations on God's law, his desire to build a permanent dwelling place for God and God's promises to him concerning the perpetuity of his throne, his prophecies of Christ, his tender and insightful prayers and praises and psalms. The weight of Jesus' testimony is great because of who he is. He's the root of David. <clears throat> now, there's two different ways of looking at this, and frankly, I find both of them edifying, <clears throat> considering Jesus being the root of David. He is the root in a sense of he's the spiritual root of David. Like David stemmed out from, from Jesus. <clears throat> it, the, the existence of David is so that we could see what a real king over God's people is really like. And so this is, the, this is why David was like he is. is because he, he sprang out of the root of, of the Lord's Christ. <clears throat> and that's a valid way to look at this. <clears throat> If it weren't for the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, David would not have been. So Jesus is the spiritual root. Just as he told the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. We could even say Jesus is the root of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he's the root of Moses. We, can, we could take this even further. <clears throat> However, the other, the other view is also true, where Jesus is the root, like he sprang out of David, which is what God promised to him, and, and uh, we'll read here in a second a prophecy of Isaiah. We speak about the relation of David and Christ. We're also speaking about the relationship between two men. <clears throat> One's an ancestor, and the other one is a descendant. And that was the promise of God to David, and it's repeated by the prophets that Christ would come from David and sit on his throne. As it concerns the fleshly lineage, Christ came from David. And that's the reason for the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. <clears throat> it tells the ancestry of the man, Jesus. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew goes all the way back to Abraham. Luke goes all the way back to Adam. Yes, Jesus is David's Lord, as it says in the 110th Psalm, and that's quoted it, by Jesus himself in Matthew 22 and Luke 20 and also in Acts 2. Of course, he is David's Lord. He's Lord of all. <clears throat> 
The identity that Jesus is establishing here is he's the one that God promised to David. The one who would sit on David's throne forever. The reigning Christ Jesus sent his angel to testify these things in the churches. That's why he brings this up at the end of the book in the Revelation. He's telling you who I am. This, this one promised to David that would sit on the throne, it's me. And I'm on the throne, and I'm testifying to you now these things. This record that I've left, I testify to you from the throne of David that these things are true. He's the one that the prophet Isaiah said would be the root out of dry ground. <clears throat> when it looked like God's promise to David had been abandoned. <clears throat> when there had not been a king over Israel for many centuries. When the house of David had all but vanished from the earth and the world was a dry and barren place. The root sprang forth out of David in Bethlehem. <laughs> And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. He's the rod and the branch that sprang from Jesse. When it looked like Jesse's lineage, who you know is the father of David, had been dried up and forgotten. When it looked like Jacob's prophecy concerning Judah, his son, was nothing more than fancy words. Then we read, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So he is the root and the offspring of David. He supports the branches, and he is the branch. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And Zechariah said, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And here in the end of the book, Jesus is testifying to the churches, Behold, it is I. I am sitting on the throne. I have overcome the wicked one and the world. I am reigning over all in righteousness. I am building the permanent temple of God. And behold, I come quickly and will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And he says, I am the bright and morning star. <clears throat> now Balaam, for whatever he was worth, he did say some good things a couple times. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. <clears throat> and Malachi said, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And Isaiah said, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. You know, the sun always rises out of darkness. <clears throat> when it's darkest, when it's coldest, when too much time has passed, when it's time for men to wake up and rise up out of their deep sleep of night and sin, the bright and morning star appeared. And it lightens the whole world and every man. It caused life to spring up and grow. It gives comfort and joyous days. Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. God is now known by men and angels because of the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because he revealed him. <clears throat> For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself is the revelation of God. All God's goodness is being revealed through him. He is the light that illumines what God is doing. There are no lights competing with Jesus. He's the bright and morning star. No other light can lighten the world like the sun does. The stars are, are too far away. The moon is just reflecting light, and the world has no light of its own. <clears throat> There's no light in the world. We must get our light from another place, and so it is with the spirit of mankind. We have no light of our own. Jesus lightens every man, and especially his saints. We would know nothing of eternal things if it were not for the light that came in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus prayed in John 17, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is the light that the bright and morning star shed upon us, to know the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Jesus rose up out of darkness and dryness and deadness, when God could have just as well destroyed the whole world and the entire race, along with the heavens and the earth. Through the grace of God, Jesus rose up in the earth and dispelled the darkness. Amen. That's why he's called the morning star. Yeah. He delivered us from the darkness that was the result of our sin. Amen. And this is who is testifying in the churches, the one who redeemed us. It is Jesus, the one who delivered us from darkness and bondage, and brought us into his marvelous light, the one who revealed the Father unto us and brought us into fellowship with him, the one who sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Everything hangs on Jesus. <clears throat> our bridegroom is now testifying to us from heaven. This is the voice of the bridegroom to his espoused bride, and it's a tender voice and a loving voice. <clears throat> All of Scripture is true. All of it's inspired and profitable. And certainly Jesus testifies to this, but especially here. He's testifying in the churches of this glorious vision of the new Jerusalem. This is where the marriage supper of the Lamb will be. This is the eternal rest of the blessed union of God and his redeemed men. I suppose there could be several good and valid responses to Jesus' testimony to us here. <clears throat> but the response that the Holy Spirit gives is, in, is the most encouraging and the best one. In verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Yeah. Has the appeal of Christ captivated your hearts? The Spirit says to us, Come on. Yeah. Come on. Look at your bridegroom. Hear him. Heed him, consider him, come, beloved of God, he's coming quickly. As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And the bride says, come. We're with you in this exhortation, Holy Spirit. We are saying to each other, come on, brothers. Come on, sisters. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Come on, if we reign, if we overcome, we'll reign with Christ. We'll be pillars in the temple of God. We'll sit with Christ in his throne now. Come on. Come on. <clears throat> Run and fight and endure to the end. Our Lord has testified the victory is sure in him. It's going to be just a little while now. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So come. And the bride's also saying to Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We long to see our Savior who gave himself a ransom for us and purchased us with his blood, who equipped us and caused us to endure, who intercedes for us forever. <clears throat> Finish the good work you have begun. We long for everlasting righteousness. We wait for the adoption, the redemption of the body. So come, Lord Jesus. We are longing for the passing of this world and to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. You made us to be a habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. So we say, come, Lord Jesus. Let us see his face. Bring us into the inheritance. Send us into the work in our incorruptible bodies. Let us see what we can do for God. And finally, the Spirit and the Bride also say, Come to all men. The Spirit of Christ is gently calling, striving and wooing with all men to come to the God that made them and the Christ that redeemed them. We make our invitations to those who do not know God. Now we're probably not going to start in Revelation 21 and 22. But the Spirit and the Bride do say, come to the lost. The Spirit says to all men, come to the blessed God. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, 
they shall be white as snow. Amen. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Amen. Heaven has already made the announcement, peace on earth, good will yeah. toward men. Amen. Come join us, be happy and blessed, have peace with God yeah. through Jesus Christ as we do. The inheritance is big enough for all, yeah. and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us up us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we as ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God for he hath made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the spirit and the bride say, come. However, we may go about preaching the gospel to the lost as Christ's ambassadors. The fundamental thing that we are saying is come. Come, not just so that you can be with us and add to our number but because Christ Jesus has reconciled us to God. <clears throat> Come and live in Christ forever. And let him that heareth say, Come. The bride is the collective of the saints, <clears throat> but here the individual is also addressed. Everyone that has tasted and seen that the Lord is good, everyone who has heard the joyful sound joins in with the whole host of the redeemed and the Holy Spirit saying to all men, come. Never has there been such a gracious offer made to the world as what God is saying through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, the bride, and every believer say, come. Come without money or price. Come without fear. And let him that is a thirst come. Him that is a thirst for what? Well, God has put a thirst in all mankind. <clears throat> You know that the devil tries to cover that thirst up or to satisfy it with temporal things, things that will, will condemn men. <clears throat> it's a thirst for things that we do not have and cannot get without him. The thirst to be accepted, the thirst to be righteous, to be free of guilt and gu guilty feelings, the thirst to live and not die, the thirst for peace and well-being, the thirst to know the reason for our existence. The thirst to know God. Jesus fills and satisfies the thirsty. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. And Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, do these things sound good to you? Amen. Now, Christ bids all men, come, Amen. and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. <clears throat> now, at the present time, this invitation is open to all men, <clears throat> whosoever will. But there's also a, there's kind of like a distance or a delay between this invitation and the actual partaking of the fountain of the water of life. The invitation's here and now, but the water of life is there and then <clears throat> in the holy city. Men are joined to Christ in fellowship here, but they must live out their lives here by faith and endure to the end in order to gain access to the water of life. 
Still, now, this invitation is real and true. <clears throat> but I also see in this invitation graciously given, this will, be, this will be a new invitation in the world to come. Like when we're right, we're right there in the presence of the fountain of the water of life and the river of water of life and the tree of life, there's going to be a fresh invitation given to come, partake. He that is thirsty, <clears throat> take of the water of life freely. Our great shepherd will look at us and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And now whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So I bid you then in closing, brethren, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Amen. Amen.